Greetings and welcome to our November edition of Local Image. It was a little over a year ago that the venue we're in opened here in downtown Wiper Lake. It's called Kellerman's Event Center and it's already been the host site for many wide-ranging events, including the one that featured the woman you're about to meet. Her name is Suzanne Worthley and her personal story is as interesting as the class she taught here last month. Bumps in the basement because the water is the conductor. Okay. You do a lot of different things. Um, can you just kind of list out what are some of the things that you do? Yeah, I was at an actual event not long ago and I was introduced with an with a unbelievably long um, tagline. Suzanne Worthley is a sensitive. That means I can sense things. That I was a psychic and that was a hard word for me for a very long time. However, I think that I own that now in terms of my psychic um, abilities are pretty strong. They called me a medium and that one bothered me a lot because I didn't feel like I was the Long Island medium because I don't necessarily, you know, walk up to everybody all day long and go, hey, your grandma's over your shoulder. But I do have the ability to hear a lot of people and or spirit energies very clearly. So I guess I own that now. A healer is what, I, and an energy practitioner is what I own the most. Um, anything to do with energy, I do own the most. And then a hospice vigil um, or a death doula is what they say. Not unlike a birth doula, I help them go to the death side of the process in terms of energy. Um, and then energy clearer or land clearer so again it does go on and on and on but they're all the same thing it's just working with energy and working with spirit how did you get started in this because I'm sure everyone asked you that question way back when I was young my father was a mortician or is still even at 80 um, is a mortician and so my family uh, was very used to death and dying and the conversation of death and or spirit was really something that was normal around our dinner table and so being very intuitive very in tune to those energies was really our normal in our household all along and I think that that just kind of maintained throughout my life but as I got older I started to be introduced to actually energy and then that turned into kind of a passion in educating myself on energy work which then turned into an actual um, job, if we can say that, in terms of being an energy healer and an energy worker. You've had a feel for it since you can remember, since you were young, but you were actually working in the corporate world for a long time. Long time, yeah. So what made your transition? Uh, I started to dabble with it when a friend of mine introduced me to what's called hands-on healing and that's technically when you do this energy work with your hands on an actual body and she was a hands-on practitioner an RN and she introduced me to it and as I started to study and started to um, look into it it was just something that my what we call cell memory knew I knew a lot of this somewhere deep inside my subconscious I knew it and that turned into really the need almost to practice and as I practiced I used family and friends first and then it just became very uh, apparent to me that this corporate world didn't feel as comfortable as this metaphysical world and I um, was fortunate enough to be working with lovely people that allowed me to transition out very slowly and long term so that I had a smooth transition because it definitely was two different vibrations of energy and uh, you know it definitely is a different change of a lifestyle and and when your kid goes to school and says hey what does your mom do you know your, your child goes well <laughs> it's, you know it's a kind of hard to put into a, a words you know it's not a real job description that most people are comfortable with every time I do a presentation especially this one I ask if everyone would just take one minute because of the fact that when we work with light energy we have the potential for dark energy and that isn't a scare and it isn't ooh -ah about demons and darkness what it just simply means is is that I choose to work in love and in light so if everyone would just do me one favor, and this isn't a huge big thing, but what I would like you to do is just get comfortable in your chair for one minute. What is happening here tonight? Well, I think we're here for a couple of reasons. One of the goals is to actually educate our audience on what a ghost actually is. And if there's actually a difference between a ghost and a spirit, which in my world of energy, there is indeed a difference. So our goal here is to teach them what a ghost is and why the energies are the way that they are and what that different energy of a spirit actually is because the vibration is two completely different things. The difference between a ghost and a spirit is simply this. One is heavy density, one is light density. When it comes to heaviness, the ghost energies are trapped here for many different You'll reasons. find tonight as we progress through this is very many serious questions about death and dying will come out. People have a very 
big fear about losing their loved one and the connection to them once they are gone. And I think what this does is it proves to them of sorts in energetic slash sort of scientific terms, they can't go anywhere and how they are omnipresent and how they are with us. And it's that actually us, it's us that is the one that does not allow we're the ones that don't allow the receiving of that love energy once somebody's gone because again we are trained to see touch and feel and gosh if my mom isn't here in 3d i can't have a relationship and i think what this class often does is it is it demystifies that what would you hope for yourself for the future I would hope for myself that this message gets out more. I had a wonderful gentleman not long ago that said, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Why doesn't anybody know about this? Is it new? And I almost fell off my chair. This goes back to the ancient seers. This has been around since the beginning of time. My goal before my lifetime is, whether it's me or it, um, I would love to see this accepted in the hospitals. I would love to see a healer walking through and clearing energies after a patient is in a room. I would love to see people retain and on staff to, to teach the death process. I would love the message to get out so much louder and stronger that this is not scary stuff. It's real and it's empowering. It isn't woo-woo, it isn't magic. It's real energy and it can be very empowering and it can be very dangerous in terms of your health. Get this information so that you can self heal, get off the meds, get off the craziness, get out of the cycle of madness that we're in as a human race and start to take care of oneself because the better you are here, the easier death process will be. They don't know where to go or how to find the light. Nobody tells us in third grade, hey, a, there is a light. B, you get to go. C, you should go, okay? Nobody really tells you that. And if you don't have a family that even talks about it, and you don't even know that you're supposed to find the light, just think, you're kind of out there going, what? And so you have to understand, yes, there is a light, and you do indeed get to go, okay? So there are miracles every day in front of your face, but you can't necessarily see, touch, or feel them. Start to remember what it felt like to be a kid. Regenerate that inner child magic and command miracles in your life. And then when they appear, two things. Don't not believe them because you asked for it. So you got it and then be grateful. So openness and gratitude will change the way that your world exists. And then you will start to understand this co-creation is mine. It's my birthright. And that's when it starts to get fun. Suzanne is a very engaging gal, and I learned a lot about ghosts and spirits and the energy we all are made of, and I loved her energy. Our next segment features another event that was filled with great energy as well, our annual Excellence in Community Television Awards honoring access producers and volunteers who make programming for suburban community channels. It was held at the beautiful Vadness Heights Commons, and here are some highlights from that that great event. Once again, I do want to welcome everybody to the 2013 Community Television Awards, Excellence in Community Television Awards. Yes, definitely. There will be no staff kind of choreographed dancing thing. In case you, anyone was fearful of having to watch me twerk tonight, there, it's not, it's not going to be a problem. Thank you all for coming, and I think we're going to have a, a, a nice time tonight. I always have some of my uh, peers at other facilities just kind of marvel at the variety of programming that we have on our channel, and also the number of live shows, the amount of political programming, the amount of great community programming, and the great thing is that it's all you guys producing it. This is actually you guys making all this great programming happen, so you guys need to give yourselves a hand. Pretty amazing. Well, we actually have some very special guests that were able to send a little message to all of our award winners, and we're gonna start off with as usual, our noob of the year. The real noob for 2013 at SCC TV is Josh Nelson. I'm so pleased to be able to present the 2013 award for multi-faith programming. 
and the winner is Lois Sadu. So the winner for the 2013 Community Involvement Award goes to Jeff Sovereign. This year's Outstanding Creative Award winner, Sarah Kelly. And I'm honored to be able to award the final production category of the evening for technical and production excellence. Dallas Pearson. Congratulations, Dallas. Keep up the great work and congratulations to all of tonight's winners and everyone who creates or supports community television. She should come on down, because yes, she is the TV19 Volunteer of the Year. The George Rouse Volunteer of the Year Award goes to Tim Kinley. And lastly, I want to thank all of you here tonight. You give your time and energy to create programs for our community channels. And it really truly is the community coming together to make things happen, to share great messages with the community that you can't find anywhere else. So thanks to each and every one of you. Stitching together a story that relates football to quilting seems as impossible as the thought of our Minnesota Vikings heading to the Super Bowl. But then again, the gals in our next local image story, unlike our Vikings, have sewn one awesome season of quilts. And on the day we caught up with them, they definitely had their game faces on and their quilts in perfect formation. Today is like the Super Bowl for our Quilt Society. <laughs> Have you and your husband ever worked that hard for a quilt show oh, yes, before in your life? We work for two years to get all these quilts ready. And so this is the culmination of all of our ladies' passion that goes into quilting. Our mission statement is to share our passion of quilting through friendship, education, and service. And you put all of these people's skills together and this is what you get. And it's a stunning array of handwork. <laughs> it's just fun to see the colors people choose and the patterns they choose and how they come together. And then when they're quilted, the patterns that are quilted in just enhance the beauty of the quilt. And it's just so exciting to see. You see the pattern? Do you see any one that's the same pattern? With quilting, we just have to put fabric in our hands and we immediately lower our shoulders, we breathe more calmly, and it's like the world, you feel like the world can be set right. This is, we call it therapy, <laughs> and it's, I think it's cheaper than a psychiatrist, <laughs> although it might not be, <laughs> but that's what we call it. We call it therapy and support and love. You'll be great. And what I notice when we go into whatever, a small group or a big group, People sit with different people all the time. Now, I think that's very telling. It's not just, I've got to get over to that table because that's where my friends are. We share the love, we enjoy each member because we've all learned something from everybody. And that's kind of the joy of it. That's just such a big celebration. Like I said, it's the Super Bowl for our quilt club. Quilting is good therapy, and good therapy is what is helping our friend and co-worker Ray Widstrand each day along his road to recovery. We want to thank everyone for their support in helping to make our Putts for Ray fundraiser such a great success. Over $12,000 was raised, along with the spirits of Ray and his family and the many good people of St. Paul's East Side. Producer Mary Klein and photographer Jeff Wilson share more in this local image story. I figured helping anybody from my side of the town, East Side, 
Since Ray Winstrand was brutally beaten by a mob of teenagers in August, St. Paul Eastsiders have shown their community is more than just a scary headline. I was so shocked when I heard it on the news. I said, this is ridiculous. I mean, I lived here for 34 years and nothing like that. Eastsiders who never met Ray have supported him through donations, prayers, and volunteering their time. Nobody needs to be mistreated. So we're hoping this will help. And that willingness to help extended far beyond St. Paul's borders. Volunteers across the metro lent a hand to help Ray and his family with mounting medical costs during the Putts for Ray fundraiser. I don't need to necessarily know the person, but I know there is a need. And um, if I can help out with that, why not? Emotions surrounding Ray's assault were still raw during the benefit. He comes back to us, and I hope that uh, he comes back totally. So, sorry. But when Ray rolled into the golf dome, he replaced any feelings of anger or sadness with joy. <laughs> All right, Ray, you made it. And those there to support him realized Ray's recovery was nothing short of a miracle. Even the doctors looked at him and said amazing. So, you know, and they've seen plenty of miracles before, I'm sure, you know. So, um, yeah, he's amazing. His head's up high and he's smiling for people. You know, his smile is a pretty darn nice smile and everybody has noticed that. And Ray, never camera shy before his assault, displayed his playful nature to the news crews anxious to hear from him. And never did he fail to welcome everyone with a smile. No one will forget how Ray got here, but the important thing to family and friends is that he's here, he's recovering, and he's got overwhelming support. I don't want to be um, naive about it. I, I understand that you know bad things happen, and, and but I, I think there's a lot more people that build things up in the world than tear things down. And yeah. I think we should focus more on those people. It's, it, it's such a tragedy that something this bad has to happen to see such good, but it is out there, and it's just heartwarming for the strangers that are praying for him and that to reach out to the family and say, we're thinking of you and praying for you, and the good is out there. It really is. It's so amazing. Please keep Ray in your thoughts and prayers and visit his Caring Bridge site for updates on his recovery. Now, our final story was supposed to be about a local guy who is well liked by those whom he comes in contact with during his weekly walks through downtown White Bear Lake. But as we found out, that's just the very tip of this surprising tale. Nestled in a narrow lot on a quiet street in White Bear Lake lives a couple of lovebirds. We love each other. <laughs> For 52 years. 52 years. <laughs> and it's fair to say that Jim and Norma Mengel's first meeting was a gift from God. At a church where he was a student pastor. Student pastor. And actually I was a visiting nurse in the neighborhood and then was a member at the church there. Becoming a pastor in Pennsylvania was an option Jim had considered early in life, but it wasn't the only option. And then I, I had it in mind, but I, I thought, well, I'm going to be a preacher or a printer. And uh, so when I finished high school, I entered college immediately. Jim worked his way through college as a printer, putting his passions for preaching aside for the time being. But pursuing his passions came to a stop upon his graduation. Well, immediately on college graduation, the war broke out in Korea. The draft was after us, and I joined the National Guard with my brother and cousin. But almost immediately, the unit was federalized. Jim completed his military service and found that his once pro-war view would change. Looking back now, he knows when that change actually took place. I had started without my knowledge, I think, uh, when I was 16, and my uncle was killed in, in uh, France, Second World War. And I, I can remember my mother screaming as she heard the news um, on the phone. And, uh, and what it meant to my grandparents, her parents, it was 
crushing. They had been married about eight years, and they were pregnant with our first child, uh, who was born after he was inducted, and, uh, and he was killed within a year in France. And uh, I didn't, at the time, I, I, I was kind of macho, gung-ho, supporting the war and so forth. But um, I guess it was years later that I became more active in the peace movement. Yeah. The peace movement played a critical role throughout Jim and Norma's life. Jim's desire to do something about the war was fueled during the time he was once again working as a printer and also serving as a preacher. When we lived in Korea, the um, Vietnam situation was just heating up. Hmm. And he w was very aware of that because he was a ch civilian chaplain for the um, Air, Force. Air yeah. Force in in Korea. As I was serving on the military base there, as a civilian, I could see that men were coming and going through Korea to Vietnam, some in bags, you know. And so when I got back, I was in demonstrations in D.C. We were living in, in Baltimore. We, we demonstrated at different places. And finally, my wife took me on this particular day to another demonstration, which I thought was going to be more or less the same. But it became very important because that was the first time he was arrested and ended up in jail. Jailed was Phil Berrigan, and, uh, a peace activist who was a Roman Catholic priest. Phil was born in Phil. Minnesota, served in World War II, and was ordained in 1955. He was active in the civil rights movement, Phil. and Jim joined him and two others in an anti-war action that would change their lives forever. That was the Baltimore Four. October 27th, 1967, we, we gave our blood the night before, and they used that on the draft files. It was, it was supposed to be significant theologically. If you read the Bible, you know, blood offering. And, and uh, at the last minute, I decided not to pour, actually pour blood. I thought, uh, at the last minute, I thought, this should be more attached to the, to the Bible and to the reason for our doing it, which was spiritual. And uh, so I passed out Bibles at the anointing, if you will. The other, the other three did pour blood, our own blood. Jim's decision to pass on pouring blood and instead pass out Bibles resulted in a commuted sentence for Jim, but not for the other three. All were labeled federal criminals. It was a difficult time for this peace-loving couple who were now also parents. I worked for the Baltimore City Health Department and uh, we had two small children. Mm -hmm. And I did take him that day where he was going, but I didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I was not actively involved, nor was I too supportive at that point in time. Right. And um, <clears throat> his family, family had a very big problem with with it. So anyway, we struggled through that for a long time with the, our phone tapped and the FBI visiting at various times. Shortly after the couple had married, Norma became the breadwinner in the family, not by choice, but by necessity, after she noticed something about Jim that caused great concern. I didn't know at all I had it until we were married. And about seven months afterward, we discovered it. And I'll tell you how. <laughs> he was a pastor in Clarington, Ohio, along the Ohio River. And so once in a while, I would go on home visits with him to the parishioners. And a couple times, he fell asleep in the middle of the visit. And I said, there has to be something wrong. And, mm. and it was finally diagnosed as, as narcolepsy, which was not very well known at that time but caused lots of problems. 
Like everything else, the couple worked through Jim's ongoing battle with narcolepsy, a condition that Jim knows now he's had at least since first grade. I would sleep in class. I would sleep reading. I, I, know, I know now that I can't read a book. It takes too long <laughs> because I fall asleep. So I read headlines. I, I, I watch the media. I can learn things that way, as, as most illiterates do. Some are very intelligent. I've found out I have an IQ of 125, but I don't seem to be able to use it properly. <laughs> and if you look around our little house, you can see that books are quite important. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I like books. <laughs> so what else That's does an 84-year-old self-described illiterate do to stay connected to his passion for the printed word and to his local community? Well, I work uh, two days a week, really. It, it amounts to that, and Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, delivering uh, the White Bear Press in White Bear, downtown and around downtown. And so the man of print and peace-loving principles continues to live his passions. Jim walks his paper route, delivering the news with love in his heart and a purpose, he says, to serve others the way Jesus did. And after 52 years of marriage, these lovebirds know well that tough times and bad news are written in our lives for a reason. Even bad news can be uh, a prompting to us to tell the good news because in almost every case we know the answers. We know what to do. We know we should love one another and love our enemies, but we don't do it all the time. Read the Bible and the newspaper together and, and then act accordingly. Act according to your faith in regard to both. And the bad news needs to be solved and, and remedied by the good news. Jim's involvement with the Baltimore Four draft protest is documented in the new film Hit and Stay, which had a recent showing here in the Twin Cities and is now showing at film festivals around the country. Jim continues to deliver the White Bear Press each week and his passions for the printed word and studying the word of God are ever present. And until next time, my final words for this show remain the same. I'm Judy Skyvoss, and as always, I do thank you for watching Local Image. <laughs>